I'm making this video because I've received messages from many of you in that you're confused on some of the topics related to the learning chapter that we just covered in class. The first question that I've received in great abundance is, what's the difference between classical and operant conditioning? Now remember, that you should always replace the word learning anywhere you see the word conditioning in your own head. Conditioning is often associated with things like brainwashing, which wasn't what they were meant to express. They, they created the word classical conditioning, what they really were trying to say was classical learning. And the word operant conditioning is the word operant learning. But let's start with classical. What is classical conditioning? Classical conditioning can be three different words all at the same time. So go ahead and in your notes, put down that classical conditioning is equal to Pavlovian conditioning is equal to respondent conditioning. All three of these words mean exactly the same thing. What all three of these mean is reflexive or automatic type of learning in which a stimulus acquires the capacity to evoke a response that was originally evoked by another stimulus. So what we're saying is that we're going to have you learn to respond to something the way you already responded to something else. And the way we're going to do that is by simply having those two things occur closely together. For example, how does a child learn to be afraid of lightning? If you remember from developmental psychology, there are two things that all children are naturally afraid of at birth. Falling and loud noises. All other fears are thought by learning psychologists to be learned by the child over time. And classical conditioning suggests that one of the ways this happens is simply because the new thing that we're afraid of is paired with something that we already were afraid of. And lightning is an easy example. Because every time lightning happens, shortly thereafter, there is a loud thunder clash. Now, that loud thunder clash is something that children are innately afraid of. So the child sees the lightning, and then the thunder happens and the child is afraid. Over time, the lightning will happen, and the child will have the fear response automatically anticipating the thunder comes until eventually the thunder itself is forgotten and the child will have the fear response directly to light. One of the best places that we see classical conditioning in our everyday experiences is through advertising. Print advertisers in particular bombard us constantly with ads that try to pair a product of some type with something that they're hoping you already have some sort of innate reaction to. Take this one, Coca-Cola being sold by Santa Claus. What's going on here? The advertisers are hoping that when you see Santa, you have this sort of, oh, elated experience, and you think of all the joy and great things about Christmas. And in all that moment of joy and greatness, there's this Coke, and Santa's holding the Coke. And then you start to connect that same feeling of joy and elation with the Coke. This ad, where they frag out said, we want you to think holiday fun when you see Coke. Happy emotions doesn't necessarily make you want to consume a drink. So Gatorade instead decided to pair their product with images of things that would make you thirsty. Like both of these athletes that have been having a hard workout. And after working out, they're looking for something to quench that thirst. And in both cases, there's a Gatorade right there. That way, by seeing this image, the next time you've been working out and you're getting that thirst, they're hoping the first thing that you would think of was a learned connection to their product of Gatorade. That's classical conditioning, pairing two things close together to make a connection. But operant conditioning is slightly different. Here we're defining upper conditioning as a voluntary response is strengthened or weakened depending on its favorable or unfavorable consequences. 
It's called operant conditioning because it's based on the concept of operant behavior, which is that the organism operates on the environment, it acts, and that operation produces a consequence. The consequence of our actions then feed back into our behavior so that in the future we make choices based on those consequences. In essence, operant learning is the strengthening and weakening of behavioral choices based on the consequences that those behaviors have when we make them originally. For example, if you are really hungry while watching this video, and just outside your room there happened to be a vending machine, and you went to that vending machine, and you went through the behavior, putting in your money and pushing some buttons, and a candy bar just happened to fall out, and that candy bar completely satisfied your hunger, and the hunger went away, the next time you would be sitting in your room watching a video like this one, and you're hungry, you're more likely to go out and try that vending machine again. On the other hand, if you went through the behavior, putting your money in and pushing the buttons, and the candy bar just sort of fell against the glass, poke, and you shook it, and you shook it, and you shook it, and nothing happened, and you got no candy bar, and your hunger persisted, you were less likely in that same situation to try that particular candy machine. Operant conditioning also appears all over the place, and one of the places where many of you probably see it is in playing video games. Video games have to find a way to get their users to continue playing, and that's done by making the consequences of the playing favorable, such as getting experience, gaining, or getting the newest armor in World of Warcraft, or perhaps even just getting the new pretty garden ribbon when you're playing Farmville. So, again, to answer the question, the difference between classical and opera conditioning is classical conditioning is simply connecting two things, such as the sleeve slug example from your text, while opera conditioning is more of a motivation for future behavior based on the consequences of past behavior, such as my sea lion here who's balancing the ball on its nose, and it gets a fish as a reward, becoming more likely to balance the ball on its nose. Now the second question that I've been getting a lot of is that you're still confused about negative reinforcement, and I told you this was a pet peeve of mine, so I'm glad that that's a question that's asked a lot. To start with, let's define reinforcement. Reinforcement is any event, circumstance, or condition that increases the likelihood of the given response will reoccur in the situation in which the reinforcement originally occurred. So, reinforcement is anything that increases future behavior. That's important to note. So when you're looking for examples of negative reinforcement, it always must increase the behavior, whether it be positive or negative. The positive and negative isn't a good thing and a bad thing. The positive and negative is that in the positive situation, something is added, while in a negative situation, something is taken away or removed. So positive, something is added. Negative, something taken away. Positive reinforcement, then, could be giving your child a hug or extra TV time for doing something you want. Negative reinforcement is where something is taken away to increase the behavior. A good example here might be, let's say, for example, you have a crying baby. If, when you go to the crying baby and you pick him up, and the baby stops crying, you become more likely to pick him up again in the future. That way, you've been negatively reinforced to pick up your child because the child stopped crying. So let's say you get into your car and you haven't put on your seatbelt and you start the engine. Oh, that's horrible. But if you do the behavior, the noise stops, which makes it more likely that the next time you get into your car, before you start the engine, you're going to reach over and put that seatbelt on. That way, when you start the engine, no noise. Negative reinforcement. 
the noise is removed, which makes you more likely to buckle up.